Are you looking for a new job? Are you hiring but struggling to find diverse, talented candidates? Then we have something that can help, our job board. Head on over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to browse listings or to place your own. This week on the job board, Front is looking for a lead product designer in San Francisco, California. Frog Design is looking for a senior interaction designer for their New York, Austin, or San Francisco offices. Matchstick is looking for a messaging director in Atlanta, Georgia. NWEA is looking for an experienced design lead in the Portland, Oregon area. One Design Company is looking for a creative director. Remote applicants are welcome to apply, but Chicago-based applicants are preferred. Minnesota State University Mankato is looking for an assistant professor of art and design in Mankato, Minnesota. And Friendly Design Company is looking for two roles, a part-time business development specialist and a full-time front-end developer. Both roles are open for their Washington, D.C. and Omaha, Nebraska locations. For just $99, you can post your job listing with us where it will be on our job board for 30 days and we'll spread the word for you about your job to our diverse audience of listeners. We also offer annual job board subscriptions. Make sure to head over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs for more info on these listings. Apply today and tell them you heard about the job through Revision Path. Get started with us and expand your job search today. Revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. And before we get into this week's interview, I just want to remind you once again that submissions are still open for Recognize. Recognize is our design anthology that features voices from designers of color and indigenous designers. This year's theme is Reboot, and we're accepting essays about the design community, design critique, etc. that fit that theme. They have to be 3,000 words or less. Submissions are going to end on May 2nd at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Visit recognize.design for more information and to submit your essay. Now let's take some time out and thank our accessibility sponsor for this episode, Brevity & Wit. Brevity & Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They accomplish this through graphic design, presentations, and workshops around IDEA, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility. If you're curious to learn how to combine a passion for IDEA with design, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit, creative excellence without the grind. Now for this week's interview. I'm talking with Kelly Walters, an artist, designer, and educator in Stamford, Connecticut. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Kelly Walters. I am an artist, educator, designer. I teach at Parsons School of Design and yeah, I make things. I make a bunch of different things, print and digital and everything in between. Nice. How are you feeling so far about 2021? 2021, you know, I was really curious to see how the inauguration was actually going to play out at the end of December. Just anxious about all the various things that have been happening. And I think the beginning of 2021 felt really rocky just for me and trying to understand like the end of one presidency, the beginning of a next, the middle of a pandemic and sort of just a lot of uncertainty. So it felt a little overwhelming, I think, but it feels like it's getting potentially better as best as better can be, I guess. I don't know if that's a thing, but yeah, I mean, I can certainly see how it it sort of feels a bit like, we're starting to see the light at the end of this long pandemic sized tunnel <laughs> in a way. Mm-hmm. So I know what you mean, you know, now, especially that we have, you know, new leadership, there's vaccines that are out there, people are getting vaccinated. It feels like things are starting to go into a different direction. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I just, I feel like I, I don't know, I'm just anxious for everyone and making sure that we kind of safely make it through the second year, I guess, of, of this, like, new world that we're in. And I'm also really curious to see kind of what patterns or observations are made in this time that will affect us longer than this time, I guess, longer than the year and change that it's been. I'm really curious to see what it looks like and like being able to reflect back maybe even in 10 years or five years, like what I remember of this era. So I don't know. I'm like reflexive, I think, in that way of like looking forward and back if I can at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. That's uh, that's kind of January is is after the the Greek, I think Greek god or demigod Janus that has one face looking forward, one face looking back. So that's a, mm-hmm, a mm-hmm. very kind of apt comparison. There are things different for you now than they were last year. I'm trying to think. At this point, last year we were maybe like a week out before everything shut down. If I recall, I think the last time I was in New York was like March 11th when we were told like two days later, everyone had to sort of stay at home. And I think like things were more sort of uncertain in some ways at the very beginning of that last year. And as I reflect on where I am now, I don't know, I I feel like there's still unknowns, but I'm I'm living to sit inside of the uncertainty it's very uncomfortable to do that, but I, I don't know. I think more than last year, I feel like this year you have to sit with the uncertainty in a way that I don't know. I I don't know how to really describe that exactly. I just feel like I'm navigating what it means to not know even more than before and not take for granted what was thought to be stable or what Mm -hmm. was thought to be certain, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So what is a a regular day like for you now? Well, my home is my office, is my classroom, is my social space. (laughs) So, you know, it's it's the all purpose room for many things. And I think it was I think it was weird to navigate that last year of like finding what the delineation is between all of those kind of spaces. But I think depending on who you're talking to in meetings, whether it's coworkers or your friends or your family, kind of figuring out a way to feel as though even at your own environment, home environment, that in a separate area or at a separate time of the day, that it can feel as though you can feel the shift. And sometimes it's about just getting up and walking outside and coming back Mm -hmm. and feeling like you've gone into a new room or changing the lighting or opening the blinds or turning on the light. I think it's like these like small actions to make it feel like you're in a different space sometimes. So I think that that's what my, I feel like that's what my day is like more and more now of just like, what are the subtleties that I can adjust in my home environment to, you know, feel like I'm in a different space, I guess. Has there been sort of a change in, how you've been teaching or anything like that? Yeah, definitely. I think now it'll be a full year of teaching remotely online. And I think that for my program in the communication design program at at Parsons, I think we had transitioned to an online teaching format. And I think what was really challenging in the beginning was like trying to figure out like, what does it mean to do a critique in this environment? What does it mean to build up student rapport and morale and all of those in community ar- around like students that you are working with that previously you were seeing physically in a particular space. And I think the difference between kind of what I've learned in that kind of crisis, mo- moving in a somewhat of a crisis mode to teach remotely versus starting the year teaching remotely is just like, I've been working with students all year that I probably won't ever get to meet in person. And so there's this difference in trying to figure out how to get to know someone as much as one can in online format through smaller group conversations or having Slack channels or things where people can sort of commune in a digital sphere. But it's definitely been different than previous years. And now has Parsons kind of been accepting of all of this and all these changes that have been going on? 
Yeah, I mean, I think every program is is navigating this in its own way. I think that, like, including ours, we have, like, tools and supplies and things that we are wanting our students to use for all these various projects. But with students kind of navigated across the world, really, you know, it makes it difficult for them to be able to have access to that. And I think that the school is aware and understands as is many other institutions as well, that like the safety protocols of social distancing and and having like rapid tests and all kinds of things to kind of make sure that people are are being safe on campus is understood. I think it's just challenging overall at many schools as well, where, you know, students want to be back, but we're kind of navigating the pace of the pandemic and, and what that looks like. What courses are you teaching right now? I am teaching a Black visual culture class, and that's a class that I've created. It's, you know, stems from some of my research. And then I'm also teaching a senior thesis course with our BFA students. A Black visual culture class. That sounds pretty dope. Yeah, I mean, I'm figuring it out. I think it's a it's an experiment and I'm learning how to teach it. And I'm learning how to teach it from the perspective that I'm seeing and, and also being influenced by how my students are seeing. And like, I feel like I'm learning as much through them as I'm providing to, to the class as well. So Mm -hmm. it, a lot of it is about learning how to teach even this material, just as much as I'm, I may know certain things. They also know things that I don't. And I try to build that into the context of the class. Now, have you taught this course in person before, or have you only just done it virtually? Yeah, like fall 2019, I taught it for the first time in okay. person. In person, it was very different. We were using like the risograph machine. We had access to come together in a classroom space and project and view, like view material together. And I think like it's a little harder to do that now. But yeah, I had taught it in person before. Okay. What does teaching do for you as a designer? And we'll get into, you know, your design work as well. But how do those two work together? I feel like they're interconnected. I mean, I think for me, teaching is a way of like relearning tools or techniques or methods that I'm using in my own practice. And so like when I'm talking with students or we're talking about projects or conceptualizing about something or trying to figure out how to make something, I think I feel like I'm sort of like a co-facilitator or co-collaborator in that where I we can talk through strategy, we can talk through approach. And I think it's so important to my practice because you know, through those discussions and my ability to kind of think through how do I deliver this material to to students? How do we discuss X, Y, or Z or think through these things? I see my own self like being able to kind of like in my practice reflect on even those lessons or conversations that I've had with with students. And I think like they inform each other. And I think my design practice with, you know, things that are happening outside of the classroom you know, those experiences working with clients or working with other artists and designers, for me, those are like our examples that I can draw upon to kind of bring into the class about like, this is how I did X, Y, or Z with, with whoever. And I think it, it lends a bit of a credibility to it as well, because it's not like I'm just like making stuff up. You know, I'm speaking from the various experiences that I've had. I think it's helpful to draw upon as lessons in the classroom space. Mm. It's interesting because I'm sure that, you know, like you say, the students are informing you as you as you are going through all of this. I wondered, though, if it was maybe easier because now you're teaching over kind of an entirely visual medium, mm. you know, teaching mm-hmm. over the web. You can use Zoom. You can point to YouTube videos. But I don't know. Have you found that it's been a little easier in some ways? Yeah, in some ways it is because, like, I can – literally we're like the only thing that's between us is the screen. Right. Mm -hmm. And like what I've really loved about this time is being able to draw on the screen over the design. So when a student is like sharing the work of like, let's say a book that they're making or progress on some design work, 
once it's up, I have the ability to annotate on the screen. And I've been doing more and more of that because I can point out very specific details. Whereas like previously, you know, it's harder to do that with, you know, everyone just looking at one big projector screen. And so I think there's a hyper focus in some way that the screen sharing and annotating various tools on the screen or or me just sharing how I do something in a software program, it just seems like the focus and attention is a little bit more direct than sometimes it can get lost in the classroom because you're like running to class, you're tired, you're not really looking at the screen, your head is down, like lots of other distractions sometimes in the space when like 15 other students are with you. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's some positives to like the hyper focus that I think lends for some students. Let's kind of switch gears here a little bit. I know we've been focusing now on your teaching and the work that you're doing there. I'm curious, were you kind of always exposed to design and art even growing up as a kid? I think so. You know, when I I look back at this in elementary school, I went to a what was called an arts magnet school. And, you know, I don't think I really fully thought through this until you're asking me now, like further back than like even college. But I think in elementary school, because it was an arts magnet, there was a huge emphasis on creative projects and like from movement and dance to like, you know, artistic projects that were happening in the art room, plays and musicals and all these various things. And I don't think I fully thought through how much of an influence it's had on on me, because once I left elementary school, I was still interested in arts and I always did band and it was definitely a music and band person. But I think what happened was that you had to choose, right? I think for middle school and high school in particular, you could only do one art or art focused discipline as part of your kind of credit sequence. And I I chose marching band and I chose band and would always be in a lot of the music classes but because of that, I only got to take like a one art class at the end of high school, which was like a graphic design class. So I think I was exposed to music or creative environments, but not really knowing what to do with it or just thinking that it might be a hobby. I think through middle school and high school, thinking that art could be a hobby not necessarily as like a profession, but at the same time, there was one other project that I did in eighth grade where I think I wrote away to Pixar and like, <laughs> and like Pixar sent me back like a folder of all of these inserts from all of the different animated films and Toy Story and Bugs Life and all this stuff. Again, I think there were things that happened, but I didn't connect the dots, I think, at that time that I was interested in some kind of computer animation or computer generated imagery kind of thing, but not knowing exactly what to do with it. There's something interesting that you you mentioned there about how kind of in elementary school, there were all of these sort of different arts and music and, and kind of, I don't know, you were exposed to a lot of it. And it had me even thinking about when I was a kid, like we had school plays, we had, mm-hmm. of course, like music classes with recorders and and like the little xylophone Mm -hmm, blocks mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff and it was always just kind of presented as options not necessarily like oh if you stick with this you could be a musician you know but more so just showing you that this is kind of out there like it's an option and Mm -hmm. of course as you go through your education you go from elementary school to middle to high school those it, it appears like those options kind of winnow away a bit like it's Mm -hmm. less about arts and more about humanities and science Mm -hmm. um depending Mm -hmm. on you know which school that you go to do you find uh, i'm curious like knowing that that was sort of your experience as an educator does that help inform you when you're teaching your students now just like the types of exposures that i've had you mean yeah yeah i mean like for me i think what's really important is that people feel like there's versatility, that they can have adaptability, that they can sort of use these different skill sets in different ways. And I think my exposure to like music, for example, 
I, while I'm not like a musician anymore, or like play the clarinet like I used to, I think being in the creative musical environment for as long as I can remember, there's just a sense of improvisation, a sense of, you know, listening for others, hearing other voices. And so those things have translated for me, even again, just using marching band, for example, the ability to be like a single individual playing inside of the sound while also creating sound, I think it's just something that it translates in other areas, I think, of my practice where you're kind of trying to be attuned and listening and taking note and being observant. And so I think that those things have, have definitely translated to teaching and working with students. What did you play in the marching band? I played clarinet. Nice. Nice. Yes. One of the <laughs> small, thin, less heavy instruments. <laughs> it's a good instrument. It is. It is. Wood, <laughs> woodwind instrument. Yeah. <laughs> when did you know that sort of working with design and art was something that you wanted to do for a living? When did I know? When I entered undergrad, I was still uncertain. I went to UConn up in Storrs, Connecticut, and I came in as an undecided, undeclared major in my freshman year. And I think I was, again, like the idea that art could be was present. There were things that I was doing that was creative, but I guess I just didn't know or have enough awareness of what could be or what was possible. But I did know that I wanted to start taking some more art classes. And it was in that process of like taking, a, I think it was like a drawing class or a painting class in my spring semester is when I was like, oh yeah, this is like immersive conversation, the looking and the thinking and conceptualizing, it just felt right. And I think it's when at that point that I, you know, applied to get into the, the graphic design program and I think it was once I was in that program and I was seeing and it was exposed to more pathways that I, I really sort of was excited about that discipline. While you were at UConn, I mean, I'm curious, like, what was your time like overall outside of just studying? Well, I also did marching band in college. So okay. I was... For me, I really liked it in that like you got to go to football games and basketball games and things like that. And I think on one hand, I was really sort of just trying to find myself as an undergrad and navigate this really rural environment. I was coming out of more of a city suburb backdrop previously, just growing up. So stores, Connecticut was really rural and so for me, there was like also this kind of tension of navigating being in a sort of isolated space and it also being really predominantly white and feeling like I was like missing, I think towards the end, as I was about to graduate, I was ready to kind of move to a more eclectic, more sort of diverse space. But I think as my time evolved while I was there, it took me time to figure out who I was and what I was saying and what I wanted to say. By the end, I was like, okay, I'm ready to go elsewhere or try something new. But I think, you know, it had its challenges. I think that I was like one of very few black students in the art program. Luckily, the year that I went through, I think we had in graphic design, I think there were like three of us that were kind of in the program together. And I think the other kind of interesting thing about UConn is that it's known for basketball and science, right? So mm -hmm. like it's, those are giant <laughs> components of the campus culture and like, you know, everyone kind of fawning around all the basketball players or science and research were like really dominant focuses of the kind of campus. As I look back, I, I was just learning how to become who I am in some way and navigating, again, what I needed to do next. When you graduated, did you feel like you were sort of prepared for the design world, like prepared to work as a designer? When I graduated, I think it was really, I felt like bereft of the academic environment in some way, because my thesis project as an undergrad was called Black. And I 
was investigating my identity, like who I am, what I wanted to say, like I was saying before. And the design work was like very, it might even be like if we were to kind of situate it almost kind of like as a contemporary artist, right? So I was making work in a way that like what I was concerned about was how it was going to be perceived in a more corporate context and how I could apply for jobs with my thesis saying black very visibly on it. I think I was just trying to, when I finished getting out of school, like I was trying to figure out what my design community would be, you know, and it was a very different time. You know, we have all these different like digital spaces, Slack spaces where people are convening and connecting and meeting each other. Yeah, I, I don't think that I knew what it meant to have a community. I didn't know like what kind of design I really wanted to do or go in. So I was like a freelancer for like the first year or so out of school where I was kind of navigating through like job boards and finding places to to do smaller freelance gig projects with. It was also in that time that one of my former professors had reached out about doing like a teaching in a class at the University of Bridgeport. And so I was like, really, can I teach? Like, (laughs) (laughs) can I do this really? And I think her reaching out and, you know, because my mom is is a teacher, like connecting with her was really kind of support. They were really supportive of figuring out the thing or not figuring out, but helping me figure out how I could sort of begin to like teach in this collegiate environment because I started in that way. I was like freelancing. I was teaching. I started out with a hybrid practice and I feel like I've kind of maintained that ever since in some way where there was like a kind of a triad of working in industry, teaching and having also a research practice that may not necessarily be for clients at the same time. Mm. And now is this kind of the beginnings of Bright Polka Dot? Yeah, I mean, and actually, Bright Polka Dot was born out of a web design class that I had in college because we were all asked to like create portfolio sites. And my name is so common that there's like hundreds of people that have my name. Kelly Walters. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, was trying to come up with these different permutations of Kelly A. Walters, Kelly Ann Walters. You know, I was just trying different versions of things. And I didn't like the other options that were left, like .biz or .net. So I was like, well, maybe I'll just go in a very different direction and just kind of think about uh, like a moniker, if you will. Like many of the fabrics and the patterns that I always sort of gravitate towards our polka dots. And so I was really interested in this idea of like polka dot. And then I was also interested in adding bright to it. Also a metaphor for myself, but also just kind of like a lively addition to polka dot, I guess. And so I I went with it. And there's a very particular pattern that I use for one of my design books that is kind of also the the very specific inspiration. I, I don't know where it is. It's somewhere in my apartment somewhere. But that can't, became like my my website name. And I've kept it ever since. And I I don't know, it just it felt right, I think, to me. Now, as you sort of, you know, started Bright Polka Dot and then even as you're kind of navigating the postgraduate world, how did Bright Polka Dot change? Like, did you sort of start it off in one way and it shifted into something else? I think what's interesting for me was navigating, wanting to work with different design studios, right? And different agencies. And again, trying to figure out how to mesh more corporate work that has nothing to do with me versus projects that are kind of self-driven and are interested in various topics or themes. In the very beginning, my portfolio on my website would reflect a lot of work that wasn't necessarily from me, but might be client oriented. That was, I don't know, it was just really corporate in a lot of ways. And I wasn't sure like what I needed to have up there to get a job to look a certain way. I think I was very conscious of 
wanting to put up work that looked like a thing that would impress someone else. As I've gotten older and, you know, as my projects have changed in what important values are important to me at this point, what was more important was having a blend of projects that I was excited about that were really connected to me, to communities that I'm a part of that could really just push forth topics, conversations, have a critical point of view. And I think that that's what's kind of shifted in the the last several years as my portfolio has continued to change and projects that I've done are kind of like, again, discussing larger, grander topics than I had previously. Okay. Let's talk about some of the projects that you've done through Bright Polka Dots. One of them that I saw, I think it was, I think it was one that I saw right off the bat was a, uh, and then forgive me, I might begin this one. I think it's God is a Black Woman, I believe is what it was titled. Yeah. So the Black Woman is God. The Black Woman is um, God. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So that one, the curators for the exhibition were Melora Green and Karen Senefero. And when I was living in the Bay Area, I worked with Soma Arts Cultural Center in San Francisco. And one of the exhibitions that had that I was invited to sort of work towards for the the design components around was the Black Woman is God. And it was the first time I think like I've worked on it like two or three times in different years for a different theme. But the first time was super exciting for me to connect with curators and the show essentially featured Black women in the Bay who were presenting art and design works in the Soma Arts Cultural Center gallery space. And I think through those projects and like thinking through the visual identity, I was just really interested in playing with color, playing with typography and subverting like expected visual tropes about what Blackness is and really kind of draw upon inspiration for things that I was seeing as typography in either old film posters or one exhibition was called Reprogramming the God Code. And I was just thinking about like the digital component of what reprogramming means and trying to think through typography that had a certain kind of digi vibe. And so, yeah, I was just like really thinking through the approach in a lot of different ways for those exhibitions. And one of the others, I I know, you know, your research does focus kind of a lot on sort of black cultural media in a way. There's another Mm -hmm. project, Superfly and Shaft. Yeah. I mean, I think what's also sort of a part of my practice is looking at like visual identities and, again, typography that are a part of really influential or iconic spaces, media spaces, whether that's films, television, music. I've been doing just deeper dives around who created this work, right? Was it created by Black designers? Was it created by non-Black designers? What does it mean that this image or symbol is actually it represents Blackness, but not have come from a Black artist or designer, I guess. And just thinking about like what that means from social and cultural standpoint and, and how within the Superfly work, just kind of amplifying and looking closely at what, what was significant for me out of that poster was the, the letter forms and hyper-isolating into certain areas and then remixing. And, you know, in some way, like I think the music influences that I've had. And I think about sort of as if I were a DJ, right? Like what are the remixes and the samplings that I can do from these different eras, from these different visual graphics? And how do you reassemble them where they can maybe speak to someone who, like my parents, like grew up with those films, but it also, the visual and the typographic play potentially speak to someone right now who's an emerging designer and maybe not has ever seen that film or series of films. So I think it's, it's a, a, it's, I like the, the idea of remix and juxtaposition. And now as we sort of delve into that more, which is, you know, your research focus, as it says in your bio, you focus on how sociopolitical frameworks and shifting technology 
influence the sound symbols and styles of black cultural vernacular in mainstream media, which sounds like a mouthful. What sort of research is happening right now on black visual culture? Like you can talk about some of the other work that you're doing or maybe something that you've seen from peers, anything like that? The thing that I'm finding really kind of interesting right now is that like a few years ago, I was just reading articles about like digital blackface and, you know, the circulation of memes and GIFs and things like that on a social channel like Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. And I was drawn to kind of understanding what does it mean to have something that's digital blackface and what is blackface? And I think I was going down a path like in terms of research of just trying to understand more historically about how blackface has, you know, surfaced in the United States and what its history and its lineage has been. And I think there's so much kind of visual content today that has a connection to that lineage. We just don't always know what it is or it's been suppressed in various ways where it's not been analyzed and talked about in the context of of graphic design, but it's analyzed and talked about in many other disciplines, whether it's media studies or, you know, Africana studies, like things like that. I, I think that there's so much scholarship that's been generated around like images and understanding the root of those images. And so, so anyway, I think for me, you know, as a designer that's working with type and image often, I just wanted to have a better understanding of that history. And I began to kind of do research around music publishing and like early music publishing. And for me was trying to trace the lineage between like a music album cover to that early music sheet cover and forms that like have surfaced in between. And so I think that it's been a lot about excavation and and trying to see what I can find and using digital collections to to see what what's available and look closely at who was publishing various works. If there's like information about the artist, sometimes the artist's name is embedded on the illustrations of those early works. And so it's just been for me right now, navigating a lot of that like historical information. And I think what I begin to do with that is again, like the remix part is like wanting to look closely at the typography and these become like typographic specimens. And I think what's, what's really loaded and charged about doing that is like the time is really charged. And so I'm trying to be mindful of like, what does it mean for my own positionality to be working on top of these works or fragmenting or, or cropping them in particular ways. What do I find sacred? What can I touch? What is uncomfortable for me in creating a collage or a remix, if you will? And I think that I struggle and and tangle with all of those things, I think, in the creation of work that responds to that research. And now you're also coming out with a book soon, right? Is this kind of sort of the culmination of this research? So no. So the book that's coming out It's called Black, Brown, and Latinx Design Educators, Conversations on Design and Race. And because there's, for me, there's multiple avenues of my practice and things that I'm exploring, right? The research that I was talking about is one avenue. Another sort of avenue of my kind of design practice is like collaborating and connecting with other design educators or designers of color. And this particular book that's coming out features... 12 interviews, one of which includes myself with design educators from across the United States and Canada. And it features just kind of an interview of our experience getting into design, navigating private and public university and college settings, and what it means to now be teaching in the environments that we are. And so I'm super excited about this book coming out and at the end of the month, actually on March 30th, just because it's the first time that I've had a public, a really, really public project, I think, like this that is being published at this scale. And so I'm excited and scared and all the things in between as well. (laughs) That's amazing. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. What do you hope people get out of it? 
I think what I hope the most is that folks like myself, emerging designers, emerging students in design can see themselves in this book. I think, you know, we're only a sampling. We're not everyone. And, you know, we can only sort of share our perspectives from, you know, our own backgrounds and what we have accomplished and done. But I think that my ultimate hope is for there to be visibility and to to see it as a a pathway, to see it as like if you're interested in teaching, you're interested in design, and you're a person of color, and specifically you're Black, Brown, and Latinx, you know, it's just a sampling of, of folks who are doing it and working through their own design practice and navigating challenges that are coming up, and also to validate any other educators who are experiencing similar challenges or successes and to recognize that like we are a bigger community than we realize and like we're only like a step away from each other in some way i think that that's something that i've i've learned a lot about and in this book like many of the the people that i've interviewed have become such good friends now and and I'm collaborating with them on multiple projects and I just think to feel connected to each other has really been life-changing for me in the last year because I think the project was born out of a panel presentation at the College Art Association and I think that was literally the last conference and the last time that I've seen many of the people in this book in person. And it, I think for us to be together in that space was life-changing for me. I'm sure it was for others just to, to think about a panel that reflects us, talks about our experiences is sometimes really, it feels like it can be very rare. And I think I'm wishing and wanting us to get to a point where we don't feel like we have to feel rare, that there's many of us here and there's just a bunch of us in different places. I have to say one thing that has been an interesting kind of, uh, I don't want to say improvement, I'd say uh, an interesting development from the last year or so is just how many of these types of, you know, sort of events or panels or things like this have happened where you're starting to see more black designers come together whether it's black design educators or just regular design practitioners, et cetera, that Mm -hmm. are kind of outside of what we may have seen prior to this in terms of other types of events or conferences. Like, for example, the state of black design that happened last year, you were a part of uh, where are the black designers from Mitsio Ku. These sorts of events didn't really happen before. And now it's, it's so exciting to see these happen now and that, you know, people are still continuing to work together. And even to your case, like writing books, like you're now contributing to kind of the corpus of design history by putting out a book that people can then go and reference, you know, years and years down the line. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the really exciting part that as I've met more designers, as I've met more design educators and I've been trying to kind of navigate within my own practice what the importance of like a book like this can be. There's so much power in it and it's such a privilege to be able to do so. And, you know, learning even how to do this process and and learning what it means to kind of work with a publisher and like all of that, sometimes unknown, inaccessible, out of reach sort of opportunities. And I think that like, it's so important that as I, as we learn, oh, is this how it works? How are we sharing that back out to the folks that we might be working with that may not know as as much about that process? And so I think to contribute to the the design field in this way is an honor. It's it's a privilege. I'm excited to do so, and and I'm also really just thankful for everyone in the book because. I mean, to be open and and share their stories is is also can be a very vulnerable position to put yourself in. And I'm mindful of protecting their stories and making sure that they feel like they're best represented. And and so I am so just thankful for their contributions and participating because it, it wouldn't have come together without their stories. Mm. Now, you are an artist. You're a designer. You're an educator in academia. 
how do you balance all of that? <laughs> like, do you find that there are like it's at opposition at times? Like, how do you make it all work? If you see it as like a kind of rotating hats, I think sometimes the focus is on one thing more than the other. During the year, teaching fall and spring semester is really sort of a primary focus. And then sometimes in the summer, what's really nice is there's a bit more expansive time to work on like more self-driven projects or, or other kind of commissioned works and things like that. Commission work happens, I, I think, like year round. So it happens even as I'm teaching and, you know, collaborations with different people as well. And so I think that it can be a lot at times, but I, I also, you know, I've, as I've gotten older, kind of navigating what it means to kind of rotate the focus and, you know, figure out what takes precedent right now and how can I sort of not overtax myself, but create a balance such that things can rotate. And I think by seeing things rotate, I'm less scared that I'm never going to get back to X, Y, or Z, or I, I won't be able to, to do that kind of work or that kind of work. I think I've been more interested in telling myself that things can can shift and rotate and you don't have to do everything at once. And I think that that has been really freeing for me. And, and it also just allows for a flexibility in yourself and your life and, you know, all the things that <laughs> you want to try. There's, there's an opportunity to kind of space it out because what's always important to sort of be aware of too is like not trying to do too much where other things suffer or you're diluting like the power of what it could be because you just don't have the bandwidth. What would you say is the best thing about the work that you do? The best thing that I like is when I'm connecting and meeting and bringing people together. I think that that to me of all the various projects and specifically all the different design projects where I'm meeting people or people are meeting each other. To me, that's the most important thing and the most exciting thing, the, the most beautiful thing. You know, I'm just thinking vividly of, of times when they're like, oh, you're over there. I didn't know you were there. Oh, like being able to kind of help facilitate that is exciting. If you hadn't gotten into design or I would say even if you hadn't gotten into education, what do you think you would be doing? I would be talking about race probably still, <laughs> whether, I mean, in fairness, in college, you know, I also, I was a dual major. So I studied graphic design in the art program. And I also was a communication sciences major. So if I wasn't doing design, I feel like I would still be facilitating conversations around topics of race and representation I may not have been like a designer, I guess, but I think I would probably be still very focused and interested in these topics if I, I wasn't doing what I'm doing right now. Do you feel creatively satisfied? I think there's always more that can be learned or done. And I, I think what I'm learning is that sometimes it's okay not to have it all immediately. Does that leave you wanting more, wanting to try more? Perhaps, but I think I'm okay with that. Like, I think I'm okay with not fully always having everything and working towards more, working for something else, because I feel like it creates a drive and makes it so that you're not complacent and like staying in place. So I think it's okay that I'm not always satisfied. <laughs> Mm. If that makes sense. No, that makes sense. Where do you kind of see yourself in the next like five years? Like what kind of work would you love to be doing? I feel like in the next five years, I would love to work towards other book projects. I would love to collaborate with other designers, some of which is happening right now. I want to keep learning. I want to keep growing. There's so much that I still don't know. I want to continue to find ways to connect with folks or bring people together. I know that seems really simplistic, but I, I think it can be, it's actually more challenging and to do it successfully can be an art. I'm learning what it means to be able to do that and 
to kind of work with folks passionate, interested, and excited about all aspects of design. And, you know, I just want to continue to be inspired by those that are doing really interesting work right now and celebrate what they're doing just as much as, you know, I'm trying to work towards things in my own practice. And just to kind of, you know, wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? You can find my work on Bright Polka Dot. And that is, if you're searching online, you'll find it in the browser. And then on Instagram and Twitter, I'm also at Bright Polka Dot. So you can find me there as well. All right. Sounds good. Well, Kelly Walters, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for really talking about kind of the focus behind your work. I'm excited to read the new book. Actually, Wes sent me a copy, so I'm excited to kind of really get into it. But for those that are listening, we'll put a link to it in the show notes so people can check it out. But no, I I really like the approach that you have to your work. And I hope that people kind of feel empowered and inspired from hearing your story. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Big, big thanks to Kelly Walters. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Kelly and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. And of course, thanks to our wonderful sponsor, Brevity and Wit. Brevity and Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They accomplish this through graphic design, presentations, and workshops around IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. If you're curious to learn how to combine a passion for IDEA with design, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit, creative excellence without the grind. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by RJ Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. So what did you think of the interview? Better yet, what do you think about the podcast overall? Please do not be a stranger. Hit us up on Twitter or Instagram. Just search for Revision Path. Or you can leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Let everyone you know know about this show because you know what? It really helps us grow and reach more people all around the world. As always, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.